get that started. Um, hope everybody had a restful week off. Um, certainly feels like we need more than a week off at this point, but we're almost almost done with the school year. Just one quarter left. All right, so we're going to we're going to go over syllabus and schedule a little bit today. Not much has changed from the last few quarters. Um, and then we're going to review aromatic compounds. And then your first lab assignment is really is just going to be that our standard review assignment, um, which is going to be going through the the final from last quarter and talking and uh, filling it out um, to to review what we learned last quarter. Um, and so there's going to be some overlap because we did have a little section on um, aromaticity on the final. Um, but I really just want to get us started off back on the um, on the the right foot by making sure we're all on the same page with aromatic compounds and how we're counting those since we didn't spend a ton of time on that at the end of last quarter. Um, we're still Eve. Nothing, nothing's going to really change. You guys are pretty good at this point at showing up to office hours when you need it um, via Zoom. Um, and as, as always, if you can't make my regular office hours, which are going to be, I think they all end at 11 in the morning. So, so in the mornings, the, um, 10 to 11, 1030 to 11, depending on which day of the week it is. Um, if that time slot doesn't work for you, just let me know and we can set up another time to meet. Um, the our labs are still going to be kind of the same way the the difference this quarter is that this quarter um, we would normally be focused on doing computational labs anyway um, because we'll still we'll get into um, how to use uh, computers to calculate things like molecular geometries and activation energies um, because that's a that's a field that's really growing right now as computational speed and uh, power goes up around the world. We're doing more and more things um, in the in chemistry are done theoretically and computationally before they're done in a lab, rather than just take the old school chemistry approach of throw crap in a beaker and see what happens. Um, we're trying to predict things ahead of time now. Um, and same with pharmaceuticals. Basically, pharmaceuticals are all screened computationally before they're ever even synthesized or tried in an in vivo trial, um, because it's it's a lot cheaper to buy computational power and simulate these things than it is to do a, a full on trial with mice and things like that. Um, and so that kind of they use that to screen out, and so we're only looking at you know good candidates. And so we'll do some of these computational. Um, practices. Um, and I think it'll work pretty well. It worked pretty well last quarter. It's a little bit uh, tricky, but this is an area that I'm pretty strong in. So um, I'll be able to help you through any, any, can, any problems you have. I think we've all become um, pretty good at using Zoom. I don't need to tell you guys to stay muted unless you're talking, that kind of thing. This is a holdover from last year when everybody was, what's Zoom? How is that going to work? Um, we're past that now. Um, and labs will be mostly self-paced, but there will be you know, the introduction at the beginning of each of them, just like before. Um, I will do my best to make sure that the labs are posted on Mondays so that if you have time on Mondays and wanted to try working through some of the lab stuff before um, I introduce it to you. Um, however, I, I make no guarantees on that because sometimes I'm still tweaking things up until, you know, 1250 on Tuesdays. Um, but some of these I have done before, so it should be easier for me to get them up ahead of time for you guys, so you can can read them before you come to lab. Um, as always, you guys have gotten to know my family pretty well. Um, there's my little disclaimer. I'll try to be professional and like we're in a real um, professional environment, but these hooligans I can make no promises for. Um, 
my my son has started to self-identify as a hooligan. He heard that term somewhere and he he likes it. So um but I I also do know that uh um LTUSD's schedule is changing once again. They're back in school four days a week right now for half days that end at 1255. Um, but then they're going back to school for a full day, but only four days a week at the end of the month. So I, so who knows what's going to happen with their schedule. Um, just know that I'll be flexible if any of you guys have have uh, brothers, sisters, kids you need to pick up and, and take care of. Um, we'll make it work as as that all changes. Um, about the same um, same setup as we've seen before for grades. Um, assignments, including labs and, and any homework, are going to be 30%. Quizzes are 30%. And your exams will be 30%. Um, and then you will do a lab final presentation that will be very similar to what we did for fall, where you guys find a, a research paper and then present it to the class. The difference is going to be, I'm going to be very picky about which papers you pick this time, because now you know a lot more about OCHEM. Uh, I want it to be actually centered on OCHEM, not OCHEM as some side piece to it. Um, think about where you were six months ago and uh, where you are now as far as understanding OCHEM. Um, and that's how, how I want the, the paper to be centered a lot more on the OCHEM side. Um, but I'll help you find good papers. Journal of Organic Chemistry is, is Anything you pick from Journal of Organic Chemistry is going to be fine, but there's lots of other good sources out there that are focused on OCHEM um, and sort of some of their applications. So I'm not saying that a microbio paper is still off limits. It's just got to have a lot more of the organic chemistry side to it. Um, whereas before, if it mentioned anything we talked about in the first quarter of organic chemistry, it was fair game. Now I want it to be focused on those things. Um, you won't need goggles. As, as has been the par for the course this year. Um, and I will keep providing you guys with the labs um, for the uh, procedures and everything. And then other than percent yields, we still have not really needed a calculator, right? So molecular weight percent yields, as long as your calculator can do that, you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, there is the um so guest stars what was that in reference to emily uh when you were showing pictures oh yeah i got you now yeah. like huh I, I wonder how long that's been sitting in the chat what was i talking about i felt like it was funny at the time but that was like a little bit ago <laughs> No, it's it's uh, we used and we used to call um, if somebody had to step in in for you when you were playing beer pong, we called that a guest appearance when I was in college. <clears throat> celeb shot. Yeah, celeb shot. There you go. Um, so we are going to be here's here's an example of um some of the things that we'll be looking at as far as computational chemistry goes. Um. I had a brainstorming session last year with as far as, you know, because everybody was panicked as far as what are we going to do for labs. Um, I have a better idea of what we're doing for labs this quarter, but I'm still open to suggestions. If, if you, um, I will start it. Let's see if you, any of you have any specific ideas for what we could do for labs that um, would work in a virtual environment. If you guys want to see more of me just doing demos um or watching youtube videos there's still plenty of that you could get some practical hands-on lab experience um my initial thoughts though is that probably at least half of our labs will be on computational chemistry um because that is a tangible skill that you can get good at that will be helpful um, potentially in the future if you go into any sort of science research um, being good with computational chemistry, even if you're not going into the same fields that we're going to be practicing on, knowing how these different systems work is still a valuable skill, even if you would have to then. It's, it's like knowing Excel. Um, if you're good at Excel, you can apply that to anything. If you're good at, at using 
um, computers to do chemistry, there's a lot of different applications for that. Um, so this is one that I actually made last spring break, this figure, um, where basically we we're looking, it's looking at 1,3-butadiene, which is the molecule here, and rotating it around this bond here. So going from the S cis to the S trans. If you guys remember those terms, remember S, it's the figure as it's drawn here is in something close to the S cis position, where you can have those two pi bonds can be kind of pointed in the same direction so you can have resonance happening. And then, but then as you rotate towards the S trans, um, we actually, you actually can calculate going uphill in energy as you follow along that that pathway. And so we can actually build our own um, potential energy surfaces now. They're not just purely um, going to be something that we just draw and make a guess at and make it qualitatively right. We can actually put um, we can actually put numbers to this. And one of the things this, this is showing is I was using this to decide which um, which of these different methods of calculating we'd be using. Because um, they do give slightly, they're all kind of qualitatively the same, but all these different methods, um, B3LIP, MO62X, M11, M11L, um, all make the calculations a little bit differently at the quantum mechanical level. They all make different assumptions um, in, in ways that, that affect the actual energies that we calculate a little bit. So these computational chemistry numbers are not perfect. They're not exact. Um, turns out you can use Schrodinger's equation and make it exact for uh, as long as you only have two charged particles. So as long as you're talking about hydrogen with a single electron, then you can get exact numbers for Schrodinger's equation and quantum mechanics is beautiful. Um, but if you get two electrons or any more electrons than one electron, um, then it doesn't behave properly and we have to make different assumptions. And so that's what these different methods are. And we'll talk about that a little bit in lab, um, probably starting in week three. Um, but this entire approach is what's called ab initio. Um, ab initio in Latin means from the beginning. Um, and what it really means is that we're doing, we're gonna be doing these calculations um, and the, the physics term is from first principles, meaning we're only using raw um, theory. We're not using any measured numbers from a lab. All of the, these numbers can be derived from quantum mechanics laws. There's nothing that we had to go into a lab and measure and feed that number in. Um, so it's, they're not empirical numbers at all, which is kind of cool that this is we can actually get to the point this quarter where we're going to use quantum mechanics and then make the computers do the tricky math, but there's nothing about it is measured, which is kind of cool. Everything is predicts the behavior very, very accurately in a lot of cases, which is really cool to me anyway. Um, and then there's also, um, hopefully we can get into some pharmaceutical chemistry which is sort of what I was talking about a little bit too, where you can basically take different pieces of molecules. And this, this is not ab initio, this is not quantum mechanical. You basically, you say, okay, this piece of a molecule is gonna have this overall shape based on the quantum mechanics. And then you use these simpler methods um, that are a lot easier to model large molecules. And you basically say, okay, well, how well are these different fragments gonna fit on the surface of a protein? How well are they gonna to bind to the binding site? And that can be done um, by treating these basically just like they're random shapes. And you know, we model what the, what the charges look like, but we're not talking about at the individual electron level. Um, and so they do that a lot for pharmaceuticals because they basically just say, okay, well, a chloride is roughly the same charge as an alcohol group. So what if we replaced this alcohol on this neurotransmitter and we replaced it with a chloride that's a, got about the same charge, but it's a little bit bigger. What is that gonna do to the binding affinity? How well is it going to attach to these different pro proteins? 
Um, and so they screen them all that way and generate what's called a fragment library. And then they can kind of predict ahead of time what's going to be useful. Um, and so these sort of calculations. So if you're doing, if you're working in biological research, there's two major categories of trials that you do. You've got um, in vivo trials, which means you're trying trying something out on a live organism. Vivo means life, right? Uh, and then you've got in vitro trials, which means you're doing things on petri dishes or in test tubes. So you're still working with the same the same types of trials, but you're not doing it in a living organism. You're doing it in a lab um, with no living organisms. And then the last case is that you this, this type of trial is called an in silica. So silicon for, for doing it on a computer. So you frequently will see references to in silica trials. Means that this screening process done entirely computationally before you get into wet chemistry at all. Um, so we will, we will be looking at a lot of these in silica procedures. Um, I may have found some good, some good procedures we could use to actually try some of the pharmaceutical screening. Um, although I believe I found a way to do the ab initio calculations, um, without you guys having to install anything on your own computers. It's basically can be done entirely on servers that are run from Sonoma state. Um, I have not been able to find something similar for pharmaceutical chemistry. Um, so you, this might require us to install things, which means we run into the fact that some of you are on Macs and some of you are on Chromebooks, some of you are on PCs, and that all is a giant headache when it comes to me trying to write a procedure for you guys and you guys actually trying to get stuff done. So I'm, I'm holding this in reserve. We might just talk about it in more detail. Um, and rather than actually run any calculations ourselves, if, if it's going to be too hard for us to get the programs installed. Um, I'm also kind of tempted to make you guys write a report about uh, or do a presentation on um, lab techniques, pick a lab technique and do it. This is a link, see if it's still up. Um, a guy making coffee breaking bad style. Um, which is fun to watch. Let me make sure. It changed where all of the all the links are. I don't know how to share. There it is, share sound. Some new glassware arrived in the mail today and I gobbled this one up. It's a Soxlet extractor filled with coffee. There's a filter and a uh, Allen condenser to cool down the water. And here's uh, 250 milliliters of regular spring water and coffee amount there is a 15 milligram, 15 grams. There is an ice bath with an electric pump and it circulates the water in the condenser, cooling it down. And everything is naturally controlled with an Arduino. The pump and the hot plate are both controlled with relays by Arduino. Let's put them on. Okay, the hot plate is now heating. Water from the flask uh, vaporizes and the steam goes through this tube here and tries to escape through the cooler. It condenses because of the cold water and drips down back to the coffee. When the liquid level here rises to the height of the siphon arm here, it will empty out the contents of here and in back to the flask where it starts to vaporize again and the whole side. So this these Soxlet extractors are really interesting because it's it's a lot like an, an old school percolator, like one of those ones where you load the coffee in the top and then the water below and you put it on a on a burner like you use going camping or you may have grown up with um, using those. I don't think they're that common anymore. They're usually like octagonal shaped and made out of metal. Um, so the Soxic extractor works a lot like that, except that what happens when the water condenses at the top and drips back down, when it, water gets to a certain level, it actually starts a siphon process when it gets to this sidearm over here, um, which generates a vacuum down below and starts a vacuum filtration. 
but it so it basically will just start building up and building up and you'll see little drips of coffee coming through and then all of a sudden when the water gets up here you'll see it all pull through all at once uh, and so we won't watch the rest of this that it would make a kick-ass coffee maker as it can extract the caffeine and all the flavors from the coffee with a lower temperature so it doesn't make the coffee bitter here is a time lapse of the cavity being filled up with water and then in real time when it dumps all the contents in the into the boiling flask so i thought that was a cool video the guy got some fun glassware and his first thought was let's make coffee with it i've always wanted to try and make coffee like breaking bad um so, but there are definitely some, this is something that's really commonly used to do extractions. Um, and we've done extractions lots of different ways with steam distillation, even before COVID, right? We did steam distillation with the cloves and lemon peels. Um, this would be an even more effective way of doing that would be a, use a sock sled extractor um, because rather than just collecting everything, you're able to, to have that filtration in there um, and get stuff that's in more contact with it. So um, I'm, I'm, that's certainly a the type of analysis that you could do as part of your um, your final research project. Um, but I might have you guys do some analysis of some of some um, lab techniques as well as as part of a just a a lab write up. Um, I think I'll have you guys. If I'm remembering what I did last year correctly. Um, there's a I have you guys run some numbers in Excel on uh, distillations. Um, so we've used distillations in theory and talked about what distillations are a lot, um, but haven't done any like predictive numbers or um, which is almost getting in, into the chemical engineering side a little bit of well, how many distillations do I need to do to get to this level of purity? Um, sort of planning things out. Um, and then so we will we will keep all those possibilities in mind as potential um, lab reports if that but there is a discussion board on canvas if anybody wants to jump in there and say I'd really like to um, learn more about um, you know extracting essential oils or um, you know pick a topic of an ocam that's that's interesting to you um and you know we can i can design a lab report around you guys going out and researching and and presenting or if not presenting then doing some analysis of it um so all of our labs are fairly fluid at this point I've, like i said i've got about six of them that are pretty well set um and have been done before but then i've got you know room for other stuff as well um, based on what you guys are into Um, and if you want a good, as long as we're on YouTube, uh, if you want to see good uh, random chemistry ideas, this guy Niall Red does things that I'm pretty sure are illegal, but he does a lot of things where he like takes lithium batteries and extracts metallic lithium from them, um, or you know making metal crystals of bismuth from Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol is named that way because it's got bismuth in it. And so you can actually extract metallic bismuth from Pepto-Bismol. Um, so, the, you know, he also does a lot of stuff that's not highly advisable, um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting to watch somebody else risk their, you know, burning down their house or poisoning themselves on YouTube. Um, so if you any of the, anything that you see in here that's kind of related to OCAM, anything on you know on YouTube, um, turning aspirin pills into mint. So he's actually going the reverse way. Usually we would be taking mint and making aspirin with it, but you can treat it the opposite way and make mint from aspirin. Um, I don't know what he's making with his own pee, but um, that that link will stay unclicked for right now. Um, but yeah, there's lots of of uh, this this guy in particular is goes goes by Nile Red on which is actually the name of a of an indicator, 
actually might be the name of a stain in microbio. Who's taking microbio? Does that name sound familiar? I, I think it's an indicator, a pH indicator. Um, uh, he in particular is pretty good, but Smarter Every Day is pretty good. Um, more on the engineering side. Backyard scientist, he's the one who blew up his aquarium with um, melted salt. I think I've shown that video a few times. Um, he also does stuff like drill a hole in a watermelon and pour melted aluminum in it, and you get these cool patterns. Um, he's his uh, shtick is he's really good at getting things to really high temperatures and seeing what happens. Nile Red actually takes like over the counter products and turns them into something else. Um, but anyway, anything you guys do see from from you know YouTube channels or videos like that that sounds interesting, like hey, could we could we talk about why that happens? Um, that's that's all fair game for uh, suggesting labs. Um, all right, any questions on the la on the class itself at this point? Like I said, you guys have been doing this for a year now, so I think you guys are pretty used to how Zoom classes are going to work. Good news is, it seems like we'll be back to in-person labs, at least for the, for the fall, which is not going to help you guys because you guys will be done with most of your lab classes by then. Um, but remember, you know, if you are still around LTCC and you want to hang out three hours a week and do an audit the OCHEM labs just to get experience in labs, um, that offer is still good and it'd be free. Um, because you'd be auditing it and, you know, the class, you'll just be, you know, hanging out, working in groups with next year's, um, OCHEM classes of which you guys will know some of the people, um, because I think, I think, um, Rigney Miller and Jesus Mateo both decided not to take OCHEM this year because they wanted the in-person labs. So there'd be at least a few people that you guys know, um, in the OCHEM labs next year as well, that you'd be able to join in with if you, uh, again, if you're still around. Emily? Um, actually, I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, yes. Are you bringing back Biochem in like a year or two? Did you mention that all last quarter or did I just kind of that, thought I heard that? Um, if there is need for it, we can offer it next year. Um, if you need that class, it's the problem with that class is it's not real Biochem. By which I mean it won't transfer if you're looking at pre-med or pre-dental, it's not the biochem that would transfer for those prereqs. Um, those need, that's an upper division biochem. But if you're looking at dietetics, um, there's a few dietetics major programs, there's a few um, nursing schools that want a, a quarter of intro to biochem. Um, usually we have about three or four people a year that need it which is why we haven't offered it very much. And we're trying to, kind of, we're going to in the future turn intro to organic and intro to biochem into one class. But if there's, if some of you guys need intro to biochem, um, then we, we can absolutely bring it back. We've offered it just because we had two people that needed it in the past. Um, and we will have the ability to teach it next year because we'll have a new full-timer um, that uh, will be able to teach that class. I, I'm very interested in that class, but I'm not very good at teaching it because I don't live on the bio side of things very much. Um, so I'll be excited to hand that off to somebody else. Would that have to be an in-person class? Like, would, would there be labs for it? There are labs associated with it. And I, with us being mostly back and it not being part of a series, they're going to want us to offer that. It'll be next winter and it would be um, in-person labs, yes. Okay. Um, um, there is a, I guess I shouldn't speak too quickly. Um, so background on how online labs are working right now. Um, the chancellor's office has released a memo stating that they're not going to go backwards on, on online labs. If we, if we design a class that has online labs during COVID, they're still going to allow those labs to be online after COVID. So there's a possibility we have not offered biochem in that modality, but there's a possibility we could rewrite and submit the curriculum and get everything ready so that it can be offered online for next winter if, if there's enough demand for it. 
Um, the only reason we haven't been offering it is just because there hasn't been demand. Um, so if you are not local next year, but you really want to take that intro to biochem class, um, send me an email. And if I get, you know, more than more than one, and then that we can look at um, adapting that and making it. So in your email, tell me that you that you're not going to be local as well, because in-person labs are a lot easier, but the 100 level classes, we could get away with online labs um, even after COVID. So let me know if that's something that's that's interesting and would be useful for you guys. Um, good question. Um, I'm actually really excited about that. Our our Chem 100 numbers, enrollment numbers, have been through the roof the last two years because we're doing online labs. Um, I at least I'm assuming it is. We have we have uh, almost 60 people enrolled in Chem 100 this spring, um, for and it's all online. And I think that that's our we're the only department on campus whose numbers went up during COVID. Um, and I think it's because of the online labs. So I'm for some of these intro level classes, especially I'm, I'm open to doing more online labs and intro to biochem is certainly on that list. I think um, a lot of people had a lot of free time this past year and decided to go back to school and that's like a stepping stone class. So I think that's actually just like a good sign in like general for like the community and you have people from different areas being like, oh, I can take this class for four months or three months. So that's probably what it is too. Yeah, it's it's definitely the extra time. It's it's always really interesting to watch enrollment numbers for community colleges because we do the opposite of the economy. Um, when the economy gets bad, people lose their jobs and they go to community college. So community college numbers go up when the economy goes down. Um, and our economy didn't go down as much as anybody expected from COVID, but like you said, a lot of people had free time. Um, and so there's there's definitely that component to it as well. Um, but yeah, we definitely have people from all over, people from Sacramento, people from Grass Valley, people from San Luis Obispo taking chemistry classes at LTCC right now, which is interesting. Um, it's interesting they're doing it from slow. Yeah, I think it's partly because we're on the quarter system. Um, yeah. And I think, I don't know about Cuesta, but I know San Luis Obispo that at Cal Poly switched over to semester system. And so what happens is we start a little bit later than everybody else, right? So if you couldn't get your classes at your semester school, you could still get enrolled at LTCC because we start a week later. Um, so we get we get a lot of those sort of trickle um, trickle over. Also, um, Cuesta is not an easy school to deal. I went to Cuesta. It's not an easy school to deal with their um, their office and stuff. Like I was with the counselor at Lake Tahoe, and the counselor at Cuesta hung up on him on the phone and then wouldn't answer his call. <laughs> it's something. Yeah, about I, I. I, I get that Quest is really busy all the time, but I, I have no I have no patience for that um, for people that are going to act like that towards students and, and counselors. Um, CS and not to turn anybody off, off to CSU Humboldt, but CSU Humboldt historically gives our chemistry department a hard time um, and tries to not allow our units to transfer when legally they should. Um, and I don't know why it's Humboldt. I don't know if they just have a dickhead run in the chemistry department um or what but it's for whatever reason certain schools in the california system are just a pain to deal with and uh cuesta apparently and i know csu humboldt are like that so um good news is, is that the counseling department doesn't like to put up with that either and so they'll you know i always uh take your side and make sure that you get what's best we can uh, make sure all our units transfer and for the record, Sac State's been fantastic with that, like of transferring oh, everything over. They've done more than I thought they were going to transfer over. They're just like, yeah, this counts. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's yeah, good. it's funny because um, I applied to Humboldt just for fun, just for a backup. And then they were telling me, oh, you have to take all these classes. I'm like, but I already took bio, chem, ochem, and all that stuff. And it's crazy. I know what you mean. <laughs> Yeah, I and I, I don't even get why, because if you run the numbers, all of our units transfer the way they're supposed to and, and match up with their curriculum just fine, but they just tell you that you have to retake stuff when, when you go to Humboldt. Um, but anyway, and that that is also the same issue that's more widespread, but with the intro to biochem that I don't want you guys to get into. I don't want anybody thinking it's going to transfer at one level 
um, because it's very, very specific what that intro to biochem transfers for. Um, and it's really only, you have to look at the course level. If it's anything higher than a 100 level biochem class, ours won't transfer. Um, but if it's if you're looking at something that's a 100 level biochem class, then it transfers and, and meets requirements. But um, so just keep that in mind. Look at the program that you're trying to get into to see if that would actually be helpful for you. Um, I know in the past, what we've had to do is we've had people taking OCHEM here at LTCC simultaneously while taking upper division biochem at UNR. Um, Mattia and uh, Sam Peralta and Erina all had to do that. They all took biochem, um, upper division biochem while they were taking OCHEM here because they, that was the only way they could get the upper division biochem um, while still being in Tahoe. So, um, but good news on that front as well as there are a lot of online options. I think even Harvard has something um, aimed at biochem that's, that transfers for some schools at least during COVID, it's transferring at the upper division level, and it costs about as much as a community college class. Um, so there are online options for upper division biochem as well right now. We'll see if that holds up post pandemic. All right. Anybody has any more questions about the class itself or scheduling or what we're planning on doing in the future? Now's a good time to ask. Um, oh, I will also mention that the library is back open. I don't know if that e uh, announcement email went out to students as well, um, but anybody who's been having trouble with internet connections or just wants to separate your school life from your home life, um, the library is open and you can make appointments in two hour shifts. Um, so long enough to do your, I don't know if they're open at 8 a.m., but uh, um, if you for any any classes that you have two hour windows that you could go get good internet hang out there you just be in a different place um I, I checked out the setup it's pretty it's pretty socially distant and and looks like it's going to be um pretty good um they uh, they enclosed the quiet reading room area over this this pandemic so you can actually talk in the library without getting shushed by somebody who's reading um which was always weird to me that they were shushing the, the students were shushing the librarians that I was talking to, um, which seemed like a reversal. But uh, now they have the quiet areas all enclosed, so you can actually be in the main area and talking with tutors and stuff like that um, at a normal volume. Um, but yeah, really, if you have any issues with with internet connectivity, I'd encourage you to look into that. Um, or just to do something different. Plus you can also, even if you don't wanna go inside or if it's a really nice day outside, um, the Wi-Fi coverage goes out to the parking lot really well. They upped that specifically for COVID. So you can hang out on the on those patios in the sun and do your lecture there and still have good internet. Um, they're, they're calling it a slow thaw is what we're doing at LTCC. And the library is the first thing that they're unfreezing um, so that you can get all those resources that you need. Um, and one more, one more random um, chemistry. Actually, this applies to anything. Any of you guys who've gotten used to using um, online uh, or digital textbooks um, and are, can study from a tablet or a laptop or whatever you want to study from, um, this website, which is, it's, I'll type it into to the. Uh, um, PowerPoint here. It's B B dash OK dot CC. Um, this website is basically a searchable link or that has all of these um, PDFs of textbooks of fiction. Um, and I, I'm really just telling you about this because I'm warning you to, to watch out for this. I would not want any of you to inadvertently violate copyright law. 
So just be aware that this website exists and it delivers exactly what it promises. Um, so, you know, definitely, definitely would not be um, something I'm recommending when it comes to getting a digital copy of the textbook. Um, you definitely wouldn't want to go to this website and type in Klein Organic Chemistry. And, and see a PDF of our textbook there, including the solutions manual. Um, yeah, that, that, would be, that would be taking money right out of those publishers' pockets that have been gouging you for the last however many years of your life. Um, so definitely don't do that. Um, so I'll just put that website back up here one more time, just so you know what to avoid. Um, the b-ok.cc. Um, uh, they don't just have chemistry stuff too. They actually have a lot of different textbooks. So um, keep that in mind as you're looking at buying textbooks. Um, stay away from, from the pirated stuff. Those poor publishers having to sleep, going to sleep on, on their huge pillows of money. Uh, anyway, with that in mind, let's take a quick break. Let's do 10 minutes. Let's come back at five till. And then we'll actually get into some chemistry stuff and review what we did last quarter. Um, hey, Sean. I have a question about scheduling. Okay. So um, historically, um, our, our midterms have been the week of the 21st of May. Um, I also have four finals and three final projects at Sac State due that week. I was going to see if there is a way we could potentially make midterms in next week or if I could have an extension on that because I'm aware of it now. And so I just wanted to talk to you yeah. about it. So which, um, which you said, said it's the week of the 20th? The 21st, yeah. Because the 21st is usually my birthday. So I spend that in, actually I've had a chemistry midterm the last three, two years on my birthday. Um, so, um, but that week of, uh, I think for Sac State, I have something ridiculous, like, um, let me just go to that month. So I have at least one, two, three, I have three exams that week, and I have a final, two final projects due in a lab as well, and that's for two classes and one of them and one and then my last one for my bio class which is usually the most work heavy will post the week of okay um so looking at the the chapters and the material we're covering it makes mm -hmm. it makes a little more sense to make it early in fact it's already scheduled the week before that would that okay. work or would you um, I think that's, I, I've just, I'm so worried about it in general because I have so much stuff going on, but yeah, I could probably do that. I mean, if, that, if that's how it's scheduled, that's how it's scheduled. I was just hoping to not have it that week specifically. I, if we get, if we get further in there and you're, and you, you know, you're super underwater, um, you and I can talk off, you know, uh, and, and decide, I don't, typically like to give extensions that long. Um, I could make the argument that putting the midterm after the next two chapters makes sense as far as the material, but then we get to the point where we only have like two more weeks and then another test. And I don't like to do that either. Well, so too, um, I, I think it might be fine because I feel like for your class, it's like, it's really heavy, like the week before is like when you need to focus a lot on it. So I think that would, I think that'll probably work. But if I'm just like freaking yeah. out, um, maybe I could reach out to you and ask to prolong it or put it off to like the following Saturday or something. Absolutely. Yeah. When we get closer and we're seeing how things are going, but yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. You could be done with that on the Thursday before, and then, yeah. and then you can be, cause it, you know what it's like after a test in my classes too, right? It, everything calms down a bit for, for a week yeah. after. So that might actually be better for you. Get the midterm out of the way, as opposed to having to finish all your Sac State stuff and then start studying for my class. Yeah. Um, so as long as long as that's going to work for you, that's how it's already planned. Um, and I think that that's that that's should work out just fine. OK, because I know like it is what it is, but I just wanted to bring it up to you now because it's like a month and a half ahead of time. And I know it's coming. So I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and we'll I will keep that in mind as we get closer. I won't I won't push the midterm back 
a day if we get behind or anything like that. So, I, so that we don't stack up on that. Now that I know that you've got those issues. Okay. Thank you, Sean. No worries. All right. I'll see you in five minutes.
All right. If you guys want to, if you folks want to start bringing it back. Um, just realizing that I still have not updated the uh, dates in the syllabus from um, from last year's on this on this Canvas shell yet. So, like I said, the syllabus is not changing substantially. Um, but I have to update the dates and everything. So the dates are a little bit off here, but here's a decent overview of what we're going to be looking at. Um, of course, we're starting a little bit ahead because we got one good lecture in on aromaticity before. So our review is talking about aromaticity and then your um, first lab assignment is going to be doing that, your homework assignment where, and because we already did the carbon 13 NMR lab as well. Um, and we'll review some of that and we'll talk more about NMR in general, just so you don't totally forget that, probably throw in a random NMR IR lab somewhere in the middle here, um, just to make sure we don't can't completely write it off, because um, we do still want to remember some of those techniques. Um, and plus, those are the fun ones, right? Giant crossword puzzles, even if they're frustrating at the time, they're really satisfying when you finally get that right structure. Um, at least for me, they were. Um, so we will, so the, the, this is good, getting changed a little bit. Uh, I'll update the new syllabus and schedule as soon as I get everything all changed and fixed over. Um, but, uh, oh, the other thing I was going to mention when I started typing in, um, Emily brought up that she always gets stuck in mid, in uh, final exams or midterms on her birthday. And that reminded me of my birthday, which is the teaching demos for um, for the new biochem hire, which is uh, Friday. Um, so if we, anybody who is interested on April 30th is a Friday. And there we have, we have uh, four teaching demos that are gonna be 15 minutes a piece and then 15 minutes of students telling telling us how you felt about um, that presenter, um, and it's going to be on something that the topic is not officially set yet, but it's going to be something from a um, from either Gen Chem or Bio 100 level class um, that uh, they'll be they'll have 15 minutes to teach you about a topic. Um, so it won't be something super in depth. It's not, um, and it's going to be the same, pretty close to the same presentation four times. But if you sit through those um, and give us some feedback as to whose teaching style you liked, who you thought was a was a good instructor, then you get a free Verde burrito out of the deal, um, which is not half bad. Consider you get to for uh, uh, an, an hour or two of your time, you get a, a pretty good burrito and you get some input as to who we're going to hire next year. Um, so if you have that time available, Friday the 30th, um, check out the announcement on Canvas. Um, my my wife's email is on there because she's the one who coordinates all these things. Um, so let her know um, that you want to be a part of that, and you'll get set Zoom and in, in, uh, invite and everything as we get a little bit closer to it. So um, you know be very helpful to us, Emily. No, what time of the day that is that? No, at this point they have the entire day blocked off. Um, Part of it is because we're going to have to schedule around the candidates' schedules a little bit, um, but it, it will total, at absolute most, it would be two hours of time, but it might be spread throughout the day, for all I know. Um, and so I don't know exactly what their policy is on if you can make it to the first three, but not the last one, you know, how that all works. Um, but uh, just make sure that when, if you do come, if you do go through that process, um, that they write your name down when you're there because that we all we're going to do is phone over a list of names to Verde um, and you just show up and collect your free burrito um, if your name's on the list. Um, so definitely recommend doing that. Elke? Um, so sorry, where in Canvas? <laughs> Can we see? Oh, uh, sorry, on the, yeah, let's go look, let's look at the Canvas site. Yeah, trying to get a free burrito. So. I appreciate that. I free food used to be the uh, the glue that held my group of friends together uh, in grad school. We had a we had a uh, an email list that went around to all the different departments. Like, oh, sociology's got a seminar today. Free food at ten to ten to eleven. 
Um, oh, coffee is over in the chemical engineering department. Um, so if you go to announcements, I just um, put the announcement up yesterday and then click on it. Um, that's, that's Laura's email. Um, it's very similar to mine, except it's just Ryland because she actually worked here before I did. Um, so she got Ryland and I got S Ryland. <laughs> Um, which means she frequently gets emails meant for me um, and vice versa. So uh, let her know if you want to be a part of that and uh, she'll get you all set up. All right. Anybody else think of any good uh, questions on syllabus stuff? Okay. You guys know I have a really hard time waiting the the 10 seconds that you're supposed to wait to make it uncomfortable, make sure nobody has any questions. I always have a hard time with that. So um, just make sure that you jump in quickly if, uh, if you do have any questions. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, aromaticity and aromatic compounds. And, and again, we're using this in the chemistry sense. There are lots of compounds that are um, that are aromatic, that are fragrant in organic chemistry that are not aromatic in the chemical sense. So we'll try to avoid using the word aromatic to mean something that smells a lot. When we're in chemistry, we'll use fragrant or something like that, or strong smelling, because aromatic specifically means um, that we have those, those big conjugated pi systems. All right, so here's some some essential oils. Um, and that's actually where the term aromatic came from is that they, they've figured out how to extract these essential oils from various natural sources and they all smelled really strongly. So they call them aromatic. Uh, and then later, aromatic was redefined to mean um, with these conjugated pi systems in a cyclic structure. So these ones, um, mystericin is the one that comes from nutmeg. Um, Eugenol comes from cloves. Isoeugenol does not actually come from cloves. Um, the difference with isoeugenol is just where we wind up with a, the pi bond. The pi bond winds up being a, um, a conjugated pi bond in isoeugenol. But eugenol, which is what's actually found in cloves, it's not conjugated. You have this um, alkene that's separated from the from the benzene ring. Um, so and I believe each of these come are found in fennel and in anise. Um, so kind of licorice-y smelling. Um, I know estragol is found in fennel specifically, and I think transanethyl is found predominantly in fennel and in smaller amounts in estragol in um, fennel which is why fennel, despite being you know, a, a green stock vegetable um, that looks a lot like celery or leeks, has sort of a, a licorice-y taste to it, um, is because there's small amounts of that transanethyl in it. Um, it's also why if you cook it really heavily, that, kind of, that licorice-y taste sort of disappears because it's not very much of it and you can basically just boil it off in the process of cooking. Um, See this a lot. These are some some pharmaceuticals. Um, the other one that has a lot of aromatic compounds. You see it a lot is uh, uh, in hops, um, hops and CBD for that matter. I'm trying to think of oh alpha acids, alpha acid. Um, there are have this overall structure that does not look all that much like it's um, an aromatic compound. Um, but if you heat it, it becomes an aromatic compound. You heat it, you can drive off one of these OHs and form a benzene ring here. Um, and you wind up converting it into something that is um, more soluble in water and is also aromatic by heating it, which is why you have to boil um, before you boil, before you ferment beer, it's called wort, spelled like W-O-R-T, but pronounced like that rhymes with dirt. 
um, wort is beer before it's boiled and fermented. And you don't get a lot of the same flavors in it because you have to boil the hops before you can actually get them to form these, these hop oils, these essential oils, and that are going to be soluble. Um, and it's also why you hear phrases like dry hopped. Um, dry hop means that they threw in hops after the ferment was done. Because what happens is all of those essential oils, all those aromatic compounds actually wind up getting incorporated into the yeast cell structure. Um, the yeast doesn't digest them, but they wind up in the cell membranes of the yeast. And then when the yeast fall out, when they're done fermenting, they bring all those flavorful compounds with them. So dry hopping was a way to get around that and put some of the good flavors and aromas from hop oils back into the beer after it's done fermenting, which is basically why you're not going to get anything with a really strong, like, you know, fruity citrus smell to it without um, in a beer without it being dry hopped. You have to add the hops after the ferment is done and after the boil is done, or you just wind up boiling it off or the yeast incorporating it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get back into brewing beer because I have all the equipment still and I'm spending too much time buying other people's beer. Um, too much money, I mean, buying other people's beer. So uh, I've been thinking about beer a lot lately. Um, and it is a perfect application of organic chemistry. Yeah, Sh Sean, I was going to say, if you want to, if you want to do a lab on that, I, that I would we'll, have you. We'll look at that. That's, that brings some biochem in too, because we get the, that's a, that's a good, uh, end of the year project. Maybe, um, maybe we'll do a demo. I'll, um, uh, yeah, because it brings in biochem too, because you got to ferment things and. Um, you have to, you know, yeast cannot break down starches, so you have to mash your grains beforehand, which just means you let, um, blanking on the name of the enzyme, uh, it's the same enzyme that's in your saliva that breaks down starch in your saliva, um, amylase, that uh, you have to, you have to expose your starch to amylase so that the starches get broken down into sugars, which then the yeast can, can digest and produce alcohol. So you've got some enzyme kinetics in there. You've got some fermentation happening. Um, you've got some isomerization happening and extraction. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look into that. That'd be a good one. Just turn the patio, um, the patio at, the, at the college to a beer garden for the last Yeah, lap. well, you know, with it being so empty, I have, I've built a really, really nice, from a really, really nice brewing setup before my daughter was born. I spent like, hours and hours and way too much money building this thing it's all perfect it's computer controlled um and and then i have not brewed i've brewed once since my daughter was born and we bought a fixer upper because now it feels like if i got three hours of time i should fix something on the house um instead of brewing beer but i'm getting away from that because brewing beer is fun uh anyway did they ever read the chem lab? And did you ever get those um, benches and stuff from the chem lab you wanted to get? No, we have not started breaking down the chem lab yet. We're still planning for it. It's going to be January of 2022 is when they start construction. Okay. Um, but I still have my eye on those. Yeah. Um. Anywho. Um. Just a quick recap of how we name these benzenes. They're not named. Um, it's not technically IUPAC naming because we use them based around what is, um, what is using benzene, which is not an IUPAC name technically. Benzene is technically a common name, um, but so we still, but we still use it as the same way we would name, call it the parent molecule. Um, is still going to be the same. So, so chlorobenzene, nitrobenzene, ethyl benzene. Anything you've got attached, if you just have one thing attached to a benzene ring, you basically just name it with a prefix. Although that we do have these, um, these common names that, especially for these single substituted benzenes, um, we're still going to want to pay attention to because um, they are way more common than actually naming it as methyl benzene, or um, we don't say methyl benzene, it's always toluene. Um, so toluene and phenol are the most common to pay attention to, probably styrene as well. Um, styrene mostly gets used in the context of, of uh, it's the precursor that, that you use to make styrofoam. 
um, polystyrene is basically you take this alkene group and you react it um, in, a, in an addition reaction so that you get something that looks like you get a repeating unit that looks like two carbons, one of which has an, a benzene on it, which is then attached to another two carbons. So it just repeats indefinitely. So that's what that's what styrofoam is. What polystyrene is, is styrene that's been reacted with itself to form this addition polymer, usually with a three radical mechanism. Um, so you don't we don't see styrene by itself that much, but it's a really common molecule that if you list if you pay attention, you might see it show up in other science classes as well, or in um, they actually um, unsurprisingly in Europe they're better referring things by their proper name than we are, um, and so they act in in the UK and in in uh, a lot of former UK colonies they will actually call it polystyrene. Um, because that's the real name. Styrofoam's a brand name, technically. Um, so it's the difference between bandage and band-aid. Um, the others that are most important to pay attention to, benzoic acid and benzaldehyde, those actually make a lot of sense. It's not the same as naming it with the prefix. It's not exactly a systematic name, but those are easy to, to remember at least. Toluene and phenol, though, watch those ones. Um, so probably there will probably be something on a quiz or on the midterm that just has you just regurgitate these vocab terms to some extent, matching question or something like that we've done in the past, um, just to make sure that you've studied these at least a little bit. Um, you can always just look them up, but it's good to have them in your back pocket. Um, and there are some that are in, and I've mentioned this before, that are common in, um, that are dye substituted. Um, a lot of dye substituted um, benzenes have common names as well. So something, if you have methyl toluene or dimethyl benzene, the actual name for dimethyl benzene is xylene with an X. So xylene, two methyls on opposite sides from each other, that's most commonly known as p-xylene or para-xylene. If you remember using those para, ortho, meta, para terms, para means on opposite sides. So if you put the two methyls opposite from each other, we call that para-xylene. Um, M-xylene. would be if your two methyl groups are not opposite each other, but they're also not next door to each other. They're one removed. So that would be M-xylene. Um, and then O-xylene, ortho-xylene would be if the two methyl groups were right next to each other. And so if you live in on the Nevada side, if you go to a, a um, a hardware store in Nevada, you can actually still buy xylene as a paint thinner. Um, it's it's illegal on the California side for environmental reasons. It's it's a um, if you're careful about taking your waste to to the dump to a hazardous waste disposal site, then xylene and toluene are both pretty safe. The problem is people just tend to when you're done um, if you don't know what you're doing or you don't care about the environment, people just dump it down the drain. Um, and that's not particularly good, especially in Tahoe, um, where all of our drains go right to the lake. So, um, but it is the best paint thinner you can buy. It's a really good solvent and you can buy, it. they call it mixed xylenes, where it's a mixture of O, P, and M xylene. So it's just kind of all put together, um, or they just call it xylol. Which I'm almost hesitant to show you show you guys because it ends in ol so it should have an alcohol in it right but it doesn't because hardware stores don't label things properly um but i won't get too involved down that rabbit hole because if you get if you start getting upset about how people label 
um, chemical compounds in pop, pop culture and places outside of the lab, then we won't have time for anything else in this class. Um, the one that really gets me right now is that, uh, has anybody seen the commercials for that? They're branding it as being like an organic pharmaceuticals for kids. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It starts with a G, I think. It's really, I think it's ordinary pharmaceuticals are made with dirty ingredients and it shows like cellulose and talc, which are they're just chemicals. What do you mean they're dirty? They're organic, they're naturally occurring. Anyway, not gonna go down that route. It just makes me angry. My kids have even started groaning every time that commercial comes on because they know that they're gonna hear from me. Um, so here's, here's the slide indicating the, the various uh, ways we use ortho, meta, and para. You can just use numbers. One, two, three, four. It's never gonna be something one. And on uh, benzene, because whatever's, whatever gives it that name is going to be one. Um, so um, two nitro anisole would be the same as saying ortho nitro anisole. And then if you have meta bromo toluene, if you have something that you can name with a common name, like toluene is methyl benzene. Um, if you have another thing attached to it, then you just use a prefix. So instead of bromo, bromo methyl benzene, it's just bromo toluene. And carbon one is always going to be where that substituent is that gives that molecule its, its parent name. So toluene has, is always going to have, um, the methyl group is always going to be on carbon one if it's a toluene. So we could name that 3-bromo-toluene, or you could call it meta-bromo-toluene. Um, it's also worth, I don't know, maybe you guys don't geek out on etymology as much as I do, but I like thinking about where words come from. Um, if you've heard people refer to um, things as being meta, in recent years, meta means self-referencing in computer science terms, or it just means that you're talking about something. So um, it would be basically once removed so that you can have a conversation about a movie and that's just a regular conversation about a movie. A meta conversation would be a conversation about the conversation about the movie. It'd be once one step removed from talking about the actual event um otherwise known as drama right drama is frequently meta um because you're talking about what somebody else said about what somebody else did um and that also applies here right we're once removed they're not directly next to each other they're one step further away in the if we're talking about meta as far as substituents go Um, and then para is, is the, if you're on opposite sides, so four chlorobenzaldehyde would also be known as para chlorobenzaldehyde. Um, and just like with the, with the, talking about like alpha carbons um, and beta carbons, um, we will frequently use ortho, meta, and para when we're talking about where a reaction is going to put something rather than saying carbon one and carbon two. It can be, it can be useful to define the different positions around the benzene ring in relation to the other substituent. Um, and so the numbering system will still work, but we'll use these terms to say things like, okay, it's going to put, it's going to put a substituent on the meta position. And that could refer to one of two carbons, right? Because there are two possibilities. Um, this is just that potential energy surface that it's not really a surface, but this is the, um, the graph that showed shows that aromatics are way more stable than they should be. So a, a, if you hydrogenate an alkene, 
it releases about 120 kilojoules per mole. It's 120 kilojoules per mole more, more stable to go from cyclohexene to cyclohexane. Um, if it's a diene, it's not exactly double that. If it's an isolated diene, it would be exactly double this, pretty much. You'd get 240 kilojoules per mole downhill. But if it's a conjugated diene, they're a little bit um, lower in energy because that resonance means that these, this is a little bit more stable than it would otherwise be. Um, and so we can, we can look at that and say, okay, well, 232 kilojoules per mole instead of 240, we get about eight kilojoules per mole of stability but based on that resonance. Um, however, if we took benzene and we just tripled our initial downhill in energy, we'd expect it to be 360 kilojoules per mole downhill. But that's not what we actually see. Um, we actually see that, it, that benzene is actually more stable despite having extra pi bonds, it actually is more stable than, than cyclohexadiene. Um, it's only downhill in energy 208 kilojoules per mole, which means you get about 152 kilojoules per mole of stability from having that resonance, which is a lot of energy compared to these other numbers, right? Over here, when we just had resonance between two pi bonds, it was only eight kilojoules per, per mole. Now we're at 152 kilojoules per mole. So it's roughly 20 times more stability from just having two pi bonds that can resonate with each other. No, not 20 times, five times, no, 20 times. Yeah, close to 160 kilojoules per mole. So it's about 20 times more stable, more stability gained than the eight kilojoules per mole that we got from, from over here. Um, and so, this is the, that slide that I wanted you guys to see last quarter so that we can cover it again this time because it's, it's confusing this time. But remember, th thinking about molecular orbitals, when we were talking about diels alder reactions, molecular orbitals were a way of looking at, okay, do I have bonds? Um, how much, how stable are those bonds based on how much overlap there is? And when, we, you, when you have three pi bonds or six p orbitals that are all going to be overlapping to do this, you wind up with three really, really stable bonding orbitals where you've got a lot more overlap between the pi bonds than you have nodes. You see the most stable, the most stable bonding orbital has all of the pi bonds with their phase pointing the same direction. So there's basically no nodes in this case. These other ones, they're a little bit less. There's one node in each of these. But there's still a whole lot of overlap between those p orbitals, right? Those p orbitals are spread out over a big area, a big volume of space, which makes them stable. As you start adding more nodes in, things get less stable. Right? So this is why aromatics are so stable is because if you can fill up these bonding orbitals and not have any electrons in the anti-bonding orbitals, all of these bonding orbitals are lower in energy than having separate pi orbitals, which means that they're all contributing to that overall stability. And here's where we're getting into some new material. Um, because I think we stopped here about when we covered aromaticity before, or I skipped through the next few slides just to look at, straight to Huckel's rule, Huckel's rule. Um, if we want to explain this, we can actually look at this in terms of a potential energy surface. If we start looking at the number of possible orbitals we have, the number of possible orbitals we get from any of these systems is going to be based on how many p orbitals did we mix together in the first place. So for benzene, we had six p orbitals, which means when we put them all together and allow them to overlap or have nodes, there are six possibilities. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six different ways you can arrange things 
to have um, various amounts of overlap or various amounts of nodes in this system. If you don't have that many pi orbitals, if you have a different number of pi orbitals, the way we can arrange these is different. So if we only have four pi orbitals, we would get a system that looks like this, where you have one bonding orbital where everything's point, all the phases are pointed the same way. You have a couple of what they call non-bonding orbitals where we add one node. So you have as many nodes as pi bonds then. And then you have an anti-bonding orbital where, where you've got a lot of nodes where it's way less stable. What this means is that just because we have a conjugated pi system and it's in a circle doesn't mean it's aromatic necessarily, right? Because we can also have that anti-aromatic character. And this is where that anti-aromaticity comes from. So here's, if this is cyclooctatetraene, so, conjugated pi bonds in a ring structure, but there's four of them, there's four pi bonds, so eight different orbitals. When we actually look at the energy of those p orbitals, we wind up with a couple of electrons that are in these non-bonding orbitals. Um, and we wind up with them not being evenly paired. We wind up with unpaired electrons in this case, which is not stable. And the way we can draw these, this is what's called a frost circle. A frost circle, it basically means you draw a polygon based on how many p bond or p orbitals you have to work with, and you put one point of it down. And then you draw a line straight through the middle of it, and that's where that energy winds up being. Um, or, and you don't even really need that line in the middle. These so, but if you look at yeah, this one's not drawn exactly in an octagon shape, but you can picture how it'd be an, an octagon with one point pointed downward and one point pointed upward. And then when you start adding in these electrons, you're going to wind up with these two orbitals being the same energy, which means you have to put an electron in each of them first before you could pair them up again. Now, anytime you get that type of system, that's called open shell. An open shell system in organic chemistry just means you have unpaired electrons, which is not stable. You only see this if you have an even number of pi bonds. Right, so this is where Huckel's rule comes from. Huckel's rule is the one that says, in order to be aromatic, your conjugated pi system must be cyclic, and you have to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, which if we, sit, if we talk about electron pairs, that would be n plus 1 electron pairs where n can be any integer, which basically is another way of saying you have to have an odd number of electron pairs. If you have an odd number of electron pairs, then you won't get that open shell system. If you have an odd number of, of electron pairs, you won't get a system that looks like this with the unpaired electrons. You will only get situations like this, where all of your electrons are paired up and they're all lower in energy. You don't have any electrons. You don't have any of those orbitals right on that line. Um, and you don't wind up with any electrons being unpaired. If you have an even number of electrons, sorry, even number of electron pairs, well, then that means we would wind up with a situation like this again where we wind up having to put electrons into those anti-bonding orbitals and they wind up being unpaired. All right, so 
this is the rule. This is the law. You could even call it Huckel's law if you wanted to. This explains um, how to predict whether something is aromatic or not. The molecular orbitals and the frost circles that we were just talking about is the theory that explains why. Right, so I'm using law and theory in the scientific sense. Theory explains why something happens. Law just predicts what will happen. All right, so for these systems here, which of them is going to be aromatic? I think B. Let's see, one, they're all, they're all ring structures. They're all conjugated pi where you don't have any sp3 carbons in the, in the ring getting in the way. So it's just a matter of counting, four, five, six, seven. So aromatic. One, two, three, four, five, six, even number. Non or anti aromatic. And we get an even number again. So C doesn't work either. Right, so it's as simple as counting the electron pairs. The trick is now we need to bring in whether or not, uh, if you have lone pairs involved or if you have charges, that's gonna affect things as well, right? That's what, what was on the, um, the exam where you had to say, okay, if, if you have a negative charge, that counts as a lone pair, right? On a negative charge on a carbon. And that can resonate. And so that might add an electron pair here. If you have a positive charge, that's missing a pair of electrons, if we're talking about carbon. All right, so let's practice some more complicated ones. Some of these were on the, the final exam. I grabbed a couple of these from the, for the final exam. But this, remember your rules for, um, for delocalized electrons. Each, if there's a lone pair, it can be delocalized as long as that's the only pair of electrons that atom is contributing. So for A, The oxygen's got, a, got two lone pairs, right? So it can participate in resonance. So that would give us one, two, three, four pairs of electrons. So it's gonna be either non-aromatic or anti-aromatic. Because it's a big enough ring structure, basically anti-aromatic means less stable than if there was no conjugation. Right, so if, if we have a big ring structure, if we have a lone pair that can be part of the resonance, really what's gonna happen is this oxygen is just not gonna allow its electrons to resonate. It's gonna behave like an sp3 carbon and those lone pairs won't be allowed to resonate. Um, and so what that basically means is it's gonna be non-aromatic because if, it has, if we have to choose between non-aromatic and anti-aromatic, Anti-aromatic to be less common because that's remember that's less stable than if there was just let no resonance. So if it's a big system, if it's a big ring structure where you could have one of the oxygens not be planar um, or not share its electrons, then you're just going to wind up with it not sharing its electrons, and so you wind up with um, a non-aromatic. All right, so, and then B is gonna look just like A, right? 
it's nitrogen contributing a lone pair instead of the oxygen, but it's still the same structure, the same ring structure, same number of electrons. And so for C, now we're getting into, wait, is that lone pair, can that lone pair resonate or not? Because we have nitrogen's got a lone pair, sulfur's got two lone pairs. Remember, each atom in the ring structure can contribute at most one pair of electrons to the resonance. So this nitrogen, already is already contributing already has a pi bond so it's the nitrogen's lone pair is not going to resonate the sulfur on the other end has no lone pairs or has no pi bonds to it which means the sulfur lone pair is delocalized one of them so one two three lone pairs that are in the resonance structures that, that are sharing electrons, have delocalized electrons. So this one would be aromatic. It's a ring structure with conjugated pi bonds or, con or delocalized electrons. And there's an odd number of electron pairs. Those are our three criteria. For some reason, <clears throat> for some reason, Huckel's rule is always written as two criteria, but it's really three criteria. I'm going to clear this and go back for a second. It's really three criteria. This this is always the way it's I see it written, but I see this as three criteria. You have to have a conjugated pi system that is also a ring. Those are probably just written that way because those are the easiest to wrap your head around. It's got to be a ring and it's got to have conjugated electrons. And then this, the last criteria is that odd number of electron pairs. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Um... So if the 4n plus 2 pi, and that has to, how does, um, this is probably a dumb question, but how does that show us that it's supposed to be odd? I'm kind of confused by that. I get that it has to be odd, but just the 4n plus 2 pi bond, that is confusing me why that would show that it's odd. And that's, that's exactly why I use, uh, so 4n plus 2 pi electrons, but we always talk about electrons in pairs. Yeah. So if it's 4n plus 2 electrons, that's really 2n plus 1 pairs of electrons. OK. Right, because every pair has two electrons in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it's 2n plus 1, where n can be any integer, that's always going to be an odd number. If you plug in 0, you get one electron pair. If you plug in 1, you get three electron pairs. So if I plugged in, if I plugged in um, 1 for n, that would be 4 times 1 plus 2. That'd be six electrons, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the same thing as three electron pairs. Okay. The four n plus two. It's it's the way it's written in the book. So I wanted you to see it, but I don't. We don't think about individual electrons. We always think in pairs. Yeah. So I think about it this way. Okay. No, because that that makes sense. But I just wanted to clarify before we went on. No, perfect.
All right, so let's look at D. There's two nitrogens. Each nitrogen has a lone pair. Are either of the lone pairs delocalized? Both of those nitrogens already have a pi bond, right? If the nitrogens are already part of a pi bond, then the lone pair is stuck where it is. It's, it can't be part of the resonance. So if you have lone pairs that aren't part of the resonance, they don't matter for aromaticity because they're not part of the conjugated pi system. So then we're just looking at the pi bonds again. One, two, three. So ar aromatic. So uh, you know, we're going way back to first quarter at this point, right? That's when we first started talking about delocal, which electrons are delocalized and which ones are stuck where they are. Um, this is why it matters, is because it's going to allow us to predict things like aromaticity and you know, sometimes resonance structures wind up being important as far as predicting what products we're going to make too. So knowing which electrons are delocalized and which ones aren't um, is still a, a valuable skill. It's still one that takes practice too. How about E? Does the nitrogen have a delocalized lone pair? Does it have a lone pair at all? No, it's, it's got four bonds to the nitrogen, right? Which means normally when nitrogen's neutral, there's a lone pair. But in this case, the nitrogen's been protonated, which means that lone pair is not a lone pair anymore. It's, it's the, what was the lone pair is now this nitrogen-hydrogen bond. Basically, an H plus came by and stuck to the nitrogen's lone pair. And if it's if it's part of a sigma bond, it really can't be delocalized, right? That was one of our first rules with delocalized electrons: is sigma bonds are never going to be delocalized. Pi bonds are delocalized. Lone pairs can be delocalized, but sigma bonds are never going to break as part of a resonance structure. So that means that we're not counting that, which means, once again, we just have something that looks a lot like benzene, one, two, three. So aromatic. So what does that tell us about F? Non-aromatic? Non-aromatic, because we don't have a cyclic conjugated pi system. We don't even meet criteria one. We have a cycle, but we don't have a conjugated pi system because this nitrogen has no lone pairs. The nitrogen has no lone pairs, then that means it's going to behave just like an sp3 carbon, right? In other words, no resonance happening with that nitrogen. Which makes it non-aromatic. Right, so those are the, you gotta look at all three criteria. Usually the one that's trickiest to wrap your head around is, do I have an odd number of electron pairs? But you still gotta be watching for, is it even a ring structure? Occasionally, I'll throw one at you that's not even a ring structure. And you still got to be looking for, is that ring structure conjugated all the way around? If, there's, if the ring structure is not conjugated all the way around, then it's not going to be aromatic. So it looks 
very similar, except what's different about the oxygen versus the nitrogen? It has a lone pair, even though it's got three bonds. It's got three bonds, which gives for oxygen, that still gives the oxygen a positive charge. But three bonds means it's still got one pair of electrons that's, that's a lone pair. And now when we look at it, that's that oxygen can contribute that lone pair to the rest to the conjugation, right? So now we have one, two, three pairs of electrons that are in a ring structure and, and all three of those pairs are delocalized. So aromatic. You guys see the difference between these two, despite looking very similar, lacking that lone pair is what makes the difference. So for this, for the nitrogen one, if it wasn't protonated or if it had one proton on it, all of a sudden that looks just like the oxygen one as far as the electrons go, right? So when this compound is, is deprotonated, it's aromatic. But if you protonate it, it's non-aromatic. Right? Because when you protonate a nitrogen, you're going to take away that lone pair. Or I guess more accurately, you're going to take away the ability for that lone pair to resonate. That doesn't look particularly stable. But does it meet our criteria? Is it a cycle? Yeah. Does it have conjugated um, pi system all the way around? We've got a pi bond. Each of these nitrogens has a lone pair. So it looks weird, but from a from a theory standpoint, it's got it meets our first two criteria at least, right? It's it's a cyclic ring that has a conjugated pi system all the way around. And it's got an odd number of pairs, right? So according to our, to Huckel's rule, that should be aromatic. Despite being a really strained ring structure, it still meets all, all our criteria. And what we'll see is there's sometimes some of these compounds that seem like they should be really unstable because of things like the, the strained ring structure wind up actually existing in, maybe not in nature, but in the real world um, because making that strained ring structure allows it to become aromatic, which means sometimes that makes, we can overcome that strain energy because becoming aromatic is so energetically favorable. Um, so I'm actually kind of curious if we put this structure into mole view, it might actually be stable enough that it has has a name on mole view. So with the two minutes we have left, let's look at that out of curiosity. First off, I guess we could do uh, maybe. Let's see. That's stable enough. It has a name: dimethyl diet diazite. 
Let's get rid of the methyls and see what we get. Um, it's got pub chem entry. That's that's not exactly right. Um, so once again, Wikipedia falls down on the identifying chemicals front, but um, it's stable enough that it has a name and has a pub chem entry, which means it's stable enough that you can you can at least synthesize it. You might not be able to buy it um, and get it shipped to you, but it's stable enough that you can make it in a lab. So despite the fact that it looks really, really weird and like it shouldn't exist, it looks like an abomination, um, a crime against nature, but it does actually exist because of how much stability that you get from um, the aromaticity. And with that, we're perfectly finishing today. So lab today is gonna be working on the review assignment on your final. Um, filling it out again, and I would encourage you not to just re, not just copy what you did. Start from blank again. Remind yourself. Go, you can reference your final from last quarter if you want, if you need to at some point. But I would encourage you to try and remember what your logic was for each of these without looking at it first, and then check and see, then you can check and see if that's what you did last quarter or not. Um, so I would encourage everybody to also show up to lab. Um, I don't have anything I'm going to present to you guys, but then you can ask me questions about any of the material you were unsure about, questions about your final. I'll open some breakout rooms. You can work on it in small groups, that kind of thing. All right. So one o'clock. I'll see you guys there. And you folks have a good morning. <laughs>